Good Monday afternoon, everybody. I'm meteorologist Tim Pandages here with your tropical update. We now have Hurricane Ian. It made that upgrade to a hurricane status earlier this morning. A Category 1 sustained winds at the recording of this video at 85 miles per hour. Today is Monday, September the 26th, 2022. So what's changed since yesterday? Well, as I just mentioned, Ian made that jump and became our fourth hurricane of the 2022 Atlantic hurricane season. Now, there are trends that are troubling in terms of the forecast cast track slowing it down and stalling it out just offshore of the west coast of Florida, which would be a worst case scenario for some of the low lying areas there. Now it has strengthened and intensified to that category one, but it's also satisfied the definition for rapid intensification. That's a big buzzword that I'm sure you've been hearing thrown around there. What exactly does that even mean? Well, rapid intensification is an increase in the maximum sustained winds of a storm of 30 knots, or around 34, 35 miles per hour in 24 hours worth of time. And as we look back at the past advisories, yeah, we certainly have done that. Four o'clock advisory yesterday had wind sustained at 45 miles per hour. The one o'clock advisory today on Monday up to 85. So that's an increase of 40 miles per hour in sustained winds and a drop in central pressure now of 27 millibars. Usually we see the drop in pressure and then we see the increase in sustained winds as a result, a deeper storm, a stronger storm. Here's how it looks on infrared satellite imagery. Again, 85 mile an hour winds puts it at that category one status on the Saffir Simpson scale, how we gauge the strength or intensity of tropical systems. And it certainly looks a whole lot better or more organized, I should say, than it did yesterday when it was struggling just a little bit to get that core concentrated and some convection or thunderstorm activity to fire along it. If I take the icon off here, you can really examine this a little bit closer. So the infrared takes the temperatures of the cloud tops. The colder the cloud tops, the higher in altitude they are, the stronger they are. So you see the white shades and even some pinks flaring on up there. Extremely cold cloud tops and a lot of that convection is now wrapping around and converging around the core or the center. We still don't have an eye that's at least visible just yet, but that's likely on the way here as it's over some high octane fuel sources in terms of very warm ocean waters. And I'm gonna show you that in a second. Now, visible satellite here, this can kind of give us an indication of if we're about to see an eye warm and clear out. And there may be the first couple stages of it starting to do so with its intensification, but so far, not the case. It's coming though, as rapid intensification will likely continue for at least a little while longer. And a big reason for that is because under the the hood below the clouds. It's got a lot of fuel in the oceans of the Western Caribbean. Not only is the skin of the water very warm, we're talking 85 to 90 degree water temperatures, but that water extends down in some cases over 100 meters. And why that's important with tropical systems is because they're violent storms. They're mixing up the water. And if the warm waters were only on the skin, it would mix up cooler waters from below and eventually cancel out its fuel source, leading to a weakening system. When you have warm waters that extend down a great depth, you're continuously mixing up and replenishing that warm water for it to use to sustain a very strong storm. And you can see this is some of the highest ocean heat content, some of the warmest, deepest water in the entire Atlantic Basin. And it's not just going to be over that in the Western Caribbean, but it will also encounter that north of Cuba as it enters the Gulf of Mexico tomorrow and through Wednesday. All right, here's a look at the stats and the most recent hurricane track from the National Hurricane Center. Now we get updates from this four times a day. The most recent was at 11 o'clock Eastern time, and this is that forecast track. The next one will be at five o'clock this afternoon. So now it strengthens a little bit more. By 7 p.m. this evening, Hurricane Center says it's a Category 2, 105 mile per hour winds, 20 mile per hour stronger than where it is right now. Now, by Tuesday morning, after making landfall in western Cuba, it is strengthening to a major Category 3. Now, typically, when we have land interaction with tropical cyclone, it's briefly removed from its fuel source, those warm waters we just talked about. And usually in the Caribbean, at least, the topography is there or the terrain to disrupt the overall circulation. This part of western Cuba is relatively flat. 
So it's going to do very little to really slow down its intensification process. In fact, it continues to intensify as it moves over land. Now on the eastern side of this storm track, this is where you're going to have the worst impacts of the storm in central and western Cuba. And that's where the winds are coming onshore, piling up those storm surge values. Inundation is going to be very, very impactful in this area on top of the winds. On top of the rain, too, you'll have the seas that will be angry and building up and over the area. As it lifts farther to the north, again, still over that high octane, very warm sea surface waters, we're up to a Category 4. And as of right now, this is where the Hurricane Center thinks that it will peak at a Category 4 with sustained winds of 140 miles per hour. But with the conditions so conducive, it's not out of the realm of possibility that it gets a little bit stronger than that. If you're wondering, Category 5 status starts at 156 miles per hour. So hopefully we don't get that strong, but Category 4 is still devastating if it does impact land, which it is forecast to do. Now, something interesting I want to bring to your attention here. Notice as we get closer to the southwest coast of Florida, we start to see these timestamps get a little closer together. They get squeezed together here. So we go from 7 a.m. Wednesday morning, Category 4, to a 24-hour period later that now it's at the latitude of Tampa. And at this point in time, the wind field is expanding, the storm is getting larger, and it's lurking offshore. So you're talking impacts in the Tampa Bay area for over 24 hours because at this point in time, it's just shoving ocean water up and over the area as it's on the dirty side of the storm. Again, the onshore winds coupled with the storm movement. Storm surge is going to be the highest impact uh, thing that occurs during this storm, the highest risk through most, most of this area. Now you say, well, it's weakening a little bit as it gets farther north, but again, that wind field is expanding, so a larger area will feel the impacts from Ian as this happens. Now also I want to bring to your attention that this is a forecast cone. Just because this center line here does bring it closer to Tampa, it could certainly move inland and make landfall on the far eastern side of this cone envelope or stay well offshore. If we track it along the westernmost edge of this cone, that would be the best case in terms of this forecast of keeping it offshore and the strongest winds and the storm surge will be greatly reduced. So let's hope for that. But right now it's trending that it stays just offshore. And here's those two computer models. We're looking at the global models, the GFS and the Euro, that for a while have been going at odds with one another, with GFS saying farther west, Euro saying farther east. We've got a good consensus going up till about Wednesday, right? So now it's offshore, Category 4 major hurricane cranking off the southwest coast of Florida. Then we start to get a divergence, a split in the model agreement. We have the GFS that trends farther to the north, Euro that trends a little bit closer to the coastline heading towards Tampa. But notice what happens next here. Both models show that squiggly line. They're meandering and slowing down because they're running into a ridge or excuse me, a trough that's off to the north and west here, a frontal boundary that's dropping in from the north, and that's blocking its exit strategy to lift north quickly and inland and deteriorate. So that'll slow it down, keep it over open warm waters for longer, meaning the likelihood of a stronger storm just offshore slowing down, keeping that storm surge piling on up and really bringing the impacts, uh, making them even more severe and critical. So here's a look at the forecast cone and the suite of computer models that we have. Each line is a different computer model. That cone does encompass the majority of them, but of course there's always outliers farther well to the east. And in this last run, I will say that there's been a few more models that have been trending farther to the west. That's what we would like to see here, but also take note of how wide this cone is farther out in time you get because the uncertainty is still so high and the confidence, although higher than it was a few days ago, is still relatively low on exactly what this storm will do once it enters the southern Gulf of Mexico, just north of Cuba. So impacts are now likely in all of Florida here. Regardless of where it makes landfall, we're talking impacts, especially along the West Coast, stretching from Fort Myers all the way up to the Big Bend area. So now here's an in-house computer model that we have. I just want to show you kind of the timing of things and the structure of the storm as we go forward. So making landfall overnight tonight in western Cuba, uh, meandering off the coast of southwest Florida for the next uh, 36 to 48 hours, gaining strength. Look at how large this eye is and the eye structure and the eye wall. Very dominant feature there. And then by 10 o'clock, midday Wednesday morning, 
we've got it sitting southwest of Tampa. Now, by this time, we've already got the outer bands building up and over central Florida. That will also bring about a tornado threat. So we've already got this broad spin in the atmosphere, right? And on these outermost bands, it gets a little bit easier to spin up some water spouts, to spin up some weak tornadoes that'll put down a, a tornado funnel cloud and then lift back up relatively quickly. So that'll be the threat in interior Florida. Along the coastline during this entirety of the time, there's going to be storm surge with the onshore breeze because we'll be on the dirty side of the storm. We'll be to the east of the center, to the right of that forecast track. And that means all of those areas, low-lying areas, will be inundated by the ocean moving on inwards. Now, there's a lot you can do to prepare for a hurricane. You can board up your windows. You can evacuate. Uh, you can do all sorts of things, but you cannot really protect yourself from storm surge. The ocean is coming on and it's going to take what it wants as those levels rise. So evacuate if you are, in fact, uh, uh, informed to do so or advised to do so from local officials. Now, this particular model shows it making landfall in the Tampa Bay area. That's a divergence from the other two models that I just showed you that are farther off uh, to the west. So in terms of the advisory schedule on Ian, we get eight updates a day from the National Hurricane Center. Four intermediate updates, which I just showed you. That's just an update on its wind speed, its overall storm status and location. Now there'll be full advisories. That's when you get an adjusted cone. And that next one is coming up at five o'clock this evening, Eastern time. We'll get an intermediate eight and then another forecast cone update at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Let's talk impacts now in terms of wind, rain and storm surge. So the probability of at least seeing Hurricane force winds, so 74 mile per hour winds are greater, is growing. But most of that looks to stay just offshore, at least the probability. So we're up to about 40, 50 percent of getting those sustained winds in the Tampa Bay area. And the arrival time for those winds, the potential of them, is looking to be Wednesday morning and then into Wednesday night as you get up and closer to the Big Bend area. So timeline wise, you're looking at impact starting late Tuesday through the day Wednesday into Thursday. Now let's look at the overall wind field here. So here's the initialization. This is a model that's t that's interpreting what they think the wind field looks like at this moment in time. So tropical storm force winds quite large here, but we've got a very narrow corridor. In fact, that yellow is about the smallest area you'll find a category one wind speed. So it's a very small core of winds. Gets a little bit larger as it gets towards the western coast of, of uh, Cuba and then lifts over West Cuba. Notice it begins to take advantage of even warmer waters here. So we start to see the expansion of stronger winds, category one in the yellow, and then getting closer, gaining latitude. Check this out as we get to Thursday pre-dawn hours. We've got this storm sitting southwest just offshore of Tampa. We've got category two winds. There's that narrow corridor here. It looks to be on the northwest side of the storm. Major hurricane force winds there of 111 to 129 miles per hour. But we've got a large swath here of category one winds, and a lot of this is coming in the direction on shore. So piling the winds, piling the water, excuse me, into low lying areas, raising those storm surge values, and then it continues to lift its way north. So I'm talking about storm surge. So the Hurricane Center says that the probabilities of seeing storm surge values of up to 10 feet look to be most likely in these areas here out by Tampa. So all of that water getting funneled into the Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg area during the day on Wednesday and Thursday, leading to those levels rising in low lying areas and leading up to 10 feet potentially in some areas. Now up to eight feet as you get down to Port Charlotte, Fort Myers, Bonita Springs, and south of there it could get up to around six feet. Uh, down by the Marco Island area. So keep that in mind there. Those values could certainly change with the dependence on where the track eventually sets up. So rainfall totals. Again, this is going to be a, a storm surge event, but you'll also have some fresh water flooding too from high rainfall totals, four to six inches up to a half foot potentially in the Tampa Bay area, two to four in Tallahassee, according to the European. And then the GFS model is similar. Uh, diverges a little bit in terms of a couple of inches, but really it's going to be anywhere from three to seven inches in terms of rainfall across all of west uh, coast of Florida as we get in through the middle to end of this week. So we'll have another update for you coming up uh, in just a little while, but until next time, you can always find me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and also on TikTok.